Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Good evening. Good evening My brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. Lord Jesus, you raise us to new life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you forgive us our sins. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you feed us with your body and blood. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and on earth.
let us pray. May your people exult forever, O God, in renewed youthfulness of spirit, so that rejoicing now in the restored glory of our adoption, we may look forward in confident hope to the rejoicing of the day of resurrection. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter said to the people, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence when he had decided to release him. You denied the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. The author of life you put to death but God raised him from the dead. Of this we are witnesses. Now I know, brothers, that you acted out of ignorance, just as your leaders did. But God has thus brought to fulfillment what he had announced beforehand through the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be wiped away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. your face shine on us. Lord, let your face shine on us. When I call, answer me, O oh, my just God, you who relieve me when I am in distress. Have pity on me and hear my prayer. Lord, let your face shine on us. Know that the Lord does wonders for his faithful one. The Lord will hear me when I call upon him. Lord, let your face shine on us. O oh Lord, let the light of your countenance shine upon us. You put gladness into my heart. Lord, let your face shine on us. As soon as I lie down, I fall peacefully asleep. For you alone, O oh Lord, bring security to my dwelling. Lord, let your face shine on us. A reading from the first letter of St. John. My children, I am writing this to you so that you may not commit sin. 
But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is expiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for those of the whole world. The way we may be sure that we know him is to keep his commandments. Those who say, I know him, but do not keep his commandments are liars and the truth is not in them. But whoever keeps his word, the love of God is truly perfected in him. The word of the Lord. Be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. The two disciples recounted what had taken place on the way and how Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. While they were still speaking about this, he stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Then he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do questions arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you can see I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they were still incredulous for joy and were amazed, he asked them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish he took it and ate it in front of them. He said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Sin, sin, and sin. You know, we hear sin mentioned in all three of the readings this evening. And if you were raised in the church in the days prior to Vatican II, and even in the years after that, up until the turn of the century, it would not be uncommon to hear about sin. And chances are, most likely, it would be also in combination with terms like eternal damnation or the fires of hell. You know, this fear would be instilled in people in hopes that they would then avoid evil and do good. But it seems to me that over the past two decades or so, things have changed dramatically and not for the better. And what I mean by that is that, you know, as a culture, we have gone from having a sense of sin to not believing in sin at all. We have gone from this sense of disobeying God and breaking the commandments to simply making mistakes or missing the mark. You know, even some priests today they'll never mention the word sin in any of their homilies. And you know, last Sunday was Divine Mercy Sunday, and in my homily, I spoke about how some people seem to be doubting Thomases when it comes to God's divine mercy. 
You know, I spoke of those who doubt themselves worthy to receive God's mercy. That is, those who have convinced themselves that, you know, they've committed so many sins that God could never forgive them, or that they've committed a sin that's so grave it's unforgivable. I also spoke of those who doubt the need for God's mercy in their lives because they think that they have no sin. And I mentioned in my homily that, you know, I was convinced that there was this great doubt in God's divine mercy because for almost two years now, I've been preaching about God's love. I've been preaching about God's mercy, about our sinfulness and the need for confession, about the permanence of heaven and hell. And yet still the number of people who come to confession to come to bathe in the love and mercy of God is still so small. Now, the more that I thought about this, the more I began to wonder if, you know, the reason that so few people come to confession, maybe it is the latter one. That is that people have lost this sense of sin in their lives. And I'm not just talking about the people in Corpus Christi Parish. I'm talking all over the world. I mean, it's not uncommon to hear people say of themselves or about someone else, well, you know, I'm a good person or they're a good person. But what is really being said here? You know, what does this mean on a deeper level? What would be that makes us think that this person is somehow bad in the first place that we need to be told that they're actually good? You know, is it that people associate sin with being a bad person? Therefore, if we think we sin, then we think that somehow we're bad. You know, if this is the mindset, mindset, then it makes total sense that we would eliminate the idea of sin in the world. It makes sense that we've lost a sense of sin in our lives. Because if we tell ourselves that there's no longer sin, then we can no longer think of ourselves as sinful people. Therefore, we no, we no longer can think of ourselves as bad people. We can all be good people who occasionally or often simply miss the bark and make mistakes. But you know, here's the thing about that. That is a faulty way of thinking. You see, sin is not, me, is not about being a bad person or a good person. And this is not to say that, you know, there are not sinful people who are bad because clearly there are. But at the same time, there are also sinful people who are good. I mean, Every one of us here are sinful people, and I'm willing to bet most, if not all of us, are good people. You know, there are people who, though they were sinners when they walked the face of the earth, are now numbered among the saints in heaven. And so if this is the case, if sinners can then be both bad and good, then maybe that's not what sin is really all about. You know, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it defines sin as an offense against reason, truth, and right conscience. It's a failure in the genuine love for God and neighbor that's caused by this perseverance of attachment to certain goods. Or as St. Augustine defines it more simply, he says, sin is any thought, word, or deed that goes against the law of God. You know, nowhere in these definitions does it talk about the person being good or bad. And that's because that's not what sin is about. I mean, yes, sin is bad in itself, but sin really, at the root, it comes down to relationship. It's about our relationship with one another, that is, with our neighbor. But more importantly, it's about our relationship with God. And so sin that persevering or that perverse attachment, that thought, that word, that deed that is in contradiction to the love and will of God. And so when we do this, it becomes this barrier that separates us. It becomes this wedge that's driven between us and God. That's what sin is. So if we recognize and acknowledge our sinfulness, if we bring it to Jesus in the confessional, then he himself can then remove that wedge. He can knock down that wall that we have built up between us and God. He can restore our relationship with our Father and make it whole again. You know, understanding and admitting that we are sinners 
acknowledging our sinfulness, these are actually great blessings. You know, it's a grace from God when we can see our sinfulness and then feel the need to confess it, so much so that we should actually thank God for this grace every single day of our lives. And you know, if you don't have this grace, if you don't see your sinfulness, then ask God to give you the grace. You know, ask God to remove that veil that keeps you from seeing clearly. And you know, he will give it to you. Now, if by chance God takes his time in giving you this grace, I suggest that maybe you go find a close family member, a spouse, a brother or a sister, as I am more than certain they will help to remove that veil and help you see your sinfulness. That was a joke. <laughs> but in all seriousness, you know, the more that we recognize and acknowledge our sins and confess them, the more that we will recognize that, you know what? I can be a good person who just happens to be a sinner. And so the more that we confess our sins, the more then that we begin to recognize and realize our weaknesses. And so we come to understand that we have a need for a savior. And you know, the more that we understand the need for a savior, the closer we'll draw to Jesus Christ. Because then we'll begin to see more clearly and thus appreciate more exactly what it is he's done for us. And so our gratitude, it will grow. Our relationship with God, it will continue to deepen. And all of this happens by admitting and confessing our sins. I mean, think about it. It's like any other relationship we have. You know, if there is a wedge driven between us and someone else, whether it be the wedge of a differing opinion, the wedge of an unresolved argument, or even the wedge of something that is sinful, that wedge is going to remain in place until it's discussed. It's going to remain in place until it's worked out and thus resolved. You know, simply ignoring the issue and trying to trick ourselves into believing that it doesn't exist or that it's not real, it's not going to make that situation go away. It will not bring the relationship closer. In fact, by ignoring it and by not admitting the problem, it could actually cause that wedge to be driven even deeper in thus preventing our relationship from growing. Or even worse, it could result in that relationship ending. And so the same thing holds true regarding sin and our relationship with God. You know, ignoring it, pretending that it doesn't exist, convincing ourselves that we don't have sin, that's not the answer. If we want to be set free, if we want to remove those obstacles to our happiness, if we want to be in right relationship with God, if we want to become a saint, then we need to find the sin in our lives and we need to give it to Jesus. And not just in the privacy of our own homes when we pray, but in the confessional, because it's in the confessional that Jesus takes our sins away, but in place of them, he gives us his sanctifying grace. My brothers and sisters, the greatest saints in the world consider themselves to be the greatest of sinners. That is, they recognized their sins and they saw how that they became wedges, they became these barriers between them and God. And thus, it would keep them from having that intimate relationship with our Father in heaven. So they did what they could to eliminate that. By recognizing and acknowledging their sins, they allowed it to become a pathway to God, a pathway to eternal love. And so may we do the same so that we too will be numbered among those great saints in heaven. And so this week, let us all take some time and really honestly look at our relationship with God. You know, what are the wedges that we have driven into that relationship? What are the walls that we've put up over the years? What are our sins? And to help with that, I ask you, go find a crucifix. You know, if you have to, take it down off the wall in your home and hold it in your hands. 
You know, may we let our eyes gaze upon the wood of the cross. You know, let our fingers trace the outline and feel the roughness of the wood. Let our eyes fall upon the bruised and bloodied body of Jesus. Let our fingers touch the nail marks in the pierced side of our Lord. Because it's for our sins that Jesus was nailed to the cross. It's for our sins that he gave up his spirit so that he could restore that right relationship with us to our God and Father in heaven. So when we look upon the crucifix, may we see our sins and what it does, but may we also see the love and mercy of God, which is greater than any sin and triumphs over all. You know, the crucifix is the place where sin and love come together, and that's because sin is real. Sin exists, and we are all guilty of it. But when we bring it to Jesus Christ, he takes it to the cross, and he wipes it away with the love of his own precious blood. You know, sin is not a mistake. It's not merely missing the mark. It is a failure on our own part. And you know, if we humble ourselves and admit our failures in this life, then it too can become for us a pathway to God, a pathway to eternal life, just like the great saints. And if we do that, we will no longer need to worry about what other people think of us. We won't have to worry, do they think I'm a good person? For we too will be numbered among the great saints in heaven. And this is what happens when our sin is united to the love of Jesus Christ on the cross. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life for the world to come. Amen. Our risen and glorified Savior intercedes in our behalf before our Father in heaven. Let us now join our prayers to his. That the church be ever thankful for the gifts of the earth and the graces that flow from the real presence of Christ. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer for an increased awareness among our young people of the closeness of the Lord in their vocation discernment in the responsibility to recognize and follow him. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. The government leaders revere the sanctity of life from conception to natural death. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the unemployed and the underemployed be comforted by God, who knows all need and the longings of their hearts. 
We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the members of this congregation, united in love and service, be perfected in the love of God. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That Christ, our advocate with the Father, will bring the dead to eternal glory. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. At this Mass, we intentionally remember William and Teresa Ozog. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us also pray for all our high school kids who are gathered this weekend in Portland for the youth convention, that the Holy Spirit will shower his grace upon them all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. Let us also pray for peace in the world, especially in Syria and North Korea. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, our hear our prayer. O loving and merciful Father, you hear the prayers that we offer you this evening, and you know the many more that remain in the silence of our hearts. We ask that you grant them all according to your holy will, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Receive, O Lord, we pray, these offerings of your exultant church, 
And as you have given her cause for such great gladness, grant also that the gifts we bring may bear fruit in perpetual happiness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to acclaim you, O Lord, but in this time above all, to laud you yet more gloriously when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. For he is the true lamb who has taken away the sins of the world. By dying, he has destroyed our death and by rising, restored our life. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exults in your praise. And even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. Indeed, holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith, when we eat his bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your son and filled with his Holy Spirit 
may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Robert, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family, whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world, to our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope in the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Savior and your Lord. Look beyond the cup you drink. See his love poured out as love. He gives us some. Savior and your Lord. 
Let us pray. Look with kindness upon your people, O Lord, and grant, we pray, that those you are pleased to renew by eternal mysteries may attain in their flesh the incorruptible glory of the resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. This time I'm going to invite you to please take a seat. I have quite a few uh, announcements to make this evening. One, it's been in the bulletin for a couple weeks now. Uh, we are looking for some host families, for some exchange students. They're Catholic students uh, from various countries. Information on them is in the bulletin, but also at the various exits where you get the bulletin. There are these sheets, so please pick one up. Maybe you're interested or you know another Catholic family that may be. Uh, the contact information is there, as well as a little bit of a bio on the students, which some are good because I think some know how to make some good pasta from Italy and pizzas, so uh, if you like food, maybe that's the one for you. Um, Resisting Happiness, the yellow book that we passed out last weekend uh, by Matthew Kelly, uh, that 
flew right off the shelves faster than we thought, so we've ordered another uh, slew of books. Those should be in. I don't know if they'll make it for next weekend, but certainly the weekend after. Um, let's see, what else? Also, we are going to have a parish mission this year, so uh, May 14th and 15th, mark it on your calendars here at Notre Dame. Uh, we're bringing in Catholic speaker Ken Yasinski from Canada. Uh, he does a beautiful program that it consists of about a one-hour talk and then about 20 minutes of adoration where he plays the piano and also sings. Uh, a great message that he has, again, just a two-night mission, so that be looking. You'll see the bulletins around uh, that are posted and that more information to come on that. Um, also, you know, tonight I, I briefly mentioned just the importance of the crucifix and what it means. You know, it truly is a place where we can recognize that our sinfulness is real, uh, that it cost Christ his life, but also it's a place where he shows his great love for us. And so I'll just give you a little hint. Keep your eyes open next weekend for uh, that beautiful opportunity to see and gaze upon a crucifix, recognizing our own sinfulness and the mercy that God has for us. Also, I told you there's a lot. There's a turkey dinner about to take place by Knights of Columbus. Uh, great turkey dinner, check it out. I think it's $8 per plate. And my final announcement, um, which I'm not looking forward to making, but you may have heard rumors, and uh, as they say, all good things come to an end. So I did receive a call from Bishop Dealey, and I will be uh, reassigned to the parishes in Lewiston, Sabatis, and Lisbon Falls at the end of June. So uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. Uh, I've fallen in love with all of you. Uh, it's been an amazing time here, a uh, beautiful first, first uh, experience as a priest. So uh, you have a place in my heart for eternity. Uh -huh. Yeah. I don't know what else to say. Yeah, I will certainly miss you, but I'm going to enjoy the next 10 or 11 weeks that I have with all of you. Uh, so let's continue to, to make some good memories and to worship our Lord and draw ever closer to our loving and beautiful Savior, Jesus Christ. And with that, I invite you all to please stand. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Y'all have a wonderful weekend. You too, Paul. Thank you. Jesus is risen, let us sing. Praise Today's Mass has been brought to you through the generosity of Oakland Furniture, located at 12 Main Street, Oakland, Maine. Like LB always says, Oakland Furniture, nobody does it better. Laurie Brothers Funeral Homes, located at 107 Main Street, Fairfield, Maine. Get a great deal on a dependable vehicle that meets your needs and fits your budget.
Choose an affordable pre-owned vehicle from Central Maine Motors Auto Group. You'll always find a great selection in stock, quality inspected and warranted. And you'll save thousands when you purchase a factory-backed, certified used vehicle. For the right vehicle at the right price and the best in service with a full tank of gas, come get your keys. It's a place with no dock fees. Central Maine Motors Auto Group in Waterville, where cars and trucks always cost you less.